Hey guys, we're back with Mr. Bose um, outlining for you your NEA um, and going through some key questions. Um, so we're going to kick off now with the investigation. Uh, so our first question is, what again, what are the exam board looking for in the investigation? So um, assuming you've listened to the previous video on, um, on the original writing, some of the same advice applies here. They're looking for original, originality and some real thought um into what it is that you want to study so again there will be exam factories out there who are giving students the same kind of tasks and there are kind of i would say four or five tasks that are really really very very common um to the point where um the exam board kind of frowns on them now a little bit and they're a little bit played out these tasks include things like um recording a male and female teacher uh, and then mm. comparing the language of a male and female teacher um, of getting uh, a football commentary from the 1970s and a football commentary from the model from the modern day and and looking how the language of football commentaries has changed over time um, that's just two off the top of my head of, of tasks that are quite common now if you are say a C grade student and you're aiming for and your and your target is a C and you and you think that's what I want for university and that's what I'm happy with, by all means choose a fairly simple and straightforward task like that because what that means is rather than having to worry about methodology and data, you're going to be able to focus on just nailing the basics of the NEA and getting the best possible and, and getting the best possible mark for UC or UB. Because um, remember as well with your NEA you want you want to be getting at least a grade above what your target is for the exam. Uh, and giving yourself that little buffer yeah um but if you are someone who wants an a or an a star um, i would be recommending that you really think about choosing something that you are passionate about and that is and that is a little bit different think about what you're interested in examining in the world around you linguistically and how you can apply theory to that they are looking for it to be a language-based investigation so don't get distracted by sociological factors for example or psychological factors um try and think about okay, does this relate specifically to language and for my AO2 can I apply at least one aspect of the theory I've learned in the course it might be worth just highlighting actually the AOs so for your investigation you are marked for AO1 so your ability to apply terminology and guide the reader and um, AO2 theory your methodology um, like how you use the data and how you approach the investigation um, and then AO3 so your ability to pin down meanings created in whatever the, your data is and link that to context like we've been doing with representations um so i guess the thing that's mostly different or, or unusual is the idea of methodology and, and approach to the investigation it's quite like a science experiment isn't it really um, so yeah. on that on that point they're looking for methodology in in two separate uh, veins really that they're, they're looking for the kind of meta methodology of actually how you've gone about collecting your data and in the way that Miss Bird said, it's like a science experiment. You you want to think about controls. You have mm. controls in science, don't you? So that what you're doing is you're controlling the variables so that you're only examining one variable. So if so, let's say that you want to investigate um, if your variable is gender, yeah, then you don't want to have variable of age in there as well. So if you are comparing the language of um, I don't know Facebook Messenger, and you want to compare men and women. You want a man and a woman who are, who are the same age, because yeah. um, you don't want to have that variable of age. You want them to be the same ethnicity, ideally, because you don't want that potential variable from uh, any cultural variables that could come from differing ethnicities. Um, ideally, the same topic as well. The same topic as well, because how are you going to compare? Um, the language that they're using if they're actually talking about completely different things in different in different social contexts like you wouldn't want to compare a facebook messenger to a colleague on the one hand and a facebook messenger to a friend or family member yeah. so what you can see here actually is it's quite difficult to get exactly the right data set um so they're looking for you to have really taken the time and, and the method to think about how am i going to choose quality data here they're also looking for method in how you put the investigation together they're going to and you, your your teachers will guide you through this but you want to have an introduction section you want to have a methodology you want to have your hypothesis 
analysis broken down into nice sections where you are kind of working methodically through different steps. I'll come back to analysis shortly in a yeah. minute. Um, and then at the end, a clear conclusion with some evaluative comments on on the scope of the investigation and what could be improved in, in the next, if you were to do it on a larger scale or to repeat it. I think on evaluation as well, if if it does end up that your data is not perfect, you know, I'm not, I, I don't mean to, you know, do put your effort in and do try and make it as, as um, controlled as possible, but there is an opportunity there for you to evaluate your data um, look for weaknesses in it or limitations in your data and actually include that and you'll get good marks then for your two. You do need to be evaluating your own approach um, and, and you know what the limitations are for your data or your findings in the world of linguistics. If they're looking for you to choose the correct analytical approach that's more suitable to your data. Yeah. So basically this tends to break down into two different threads. Some students take a quantitative slash qualitative approach. So if you don't know those words, quantitative means it's based on numbers. So you might, for example, compare um, in two transcripts the number of um, material or dynamic verbs that are used in each. And you might draw some conclusions there. The problem with a, with a quantitative, quantitative approach, though, is that um, your comments can be a little bit shallow sometimes. Yeah. So you'll want to back up a quantitative approach with a qualitative approach. Now that's where you actually explore the quality and, and the, the kind of um, the subtext in, 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 in the data. So, How the word functions yeah, so, in that context. So it might be that you've you've said, all right, there's, there's 10 uh, dynamic verbs over here and there's four dynamic verbs o over here. And, you, and you'd make that basic comment, but then look at the types of dynamic verbs. Yep. Yeah. So let's say if you're expecting men to use a more dynamic vocabulary in a gender based study, what you might actually find is that even though the, the, the female um, data is showing um, less dynamic verbs, when you actually look at those dynamic verbs, they're much more aggressive and violent. For yeah. example, so you might find contradictions in the qualitative analysis that weren't there in the quantitative analysis. The other approach, if you're not going qualitative, qualitative, which tends to be the most common, um, is um, a representations based approach. So um, digging into the representations that are created. Representations based approaches tend to be nice, particularly for um, for diachronic studies, studies over time and thinking about how language usage has changed over time and 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 why the, it, that might have happened and i'm really bringing in the context hmm. um i was going to say something about the previous point you made oh it is jumping ahead a little bit but i think that that would be one of my biggest um things to avoid i i tend to write that a lot on, on students drafts that they um they They've analysed the number of, of dynamic verbs, for example, and but then just not gone and looked at what they actually were and what impact they had. Especially, you know, if you are looking at the difference between gender, you can't say that an imperative is 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 more effective than than you know a polite Im imperative without looking at how people in the conversation responded to that. So it's the same. It's it's just everything's the same about keeping things in context. And, and what Serge just said then I think is really important because that is, I think, one of the biggest DBIs that I ever write. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just on that point, finally, though, um, one of the advantages of, a, of, a, of, of having some measure of a quantitative approach is that you can vary the way you analyse and present the data. So you can include tables, pie charts, graphs. line graphs, yeah. etc. And um, th that it's not literally worth marks, but it's certainly worth consideration of this is a student in terms of AO2 who has taken a thorough methodology in terms of analysing and exploring their data. Um, but again, remember, ultimately, quantitative is not going to get you very far. You need that qualitative approach. You just um, can't get any AO3 out of it, can you? Like, yeah, and your AO3 is a decent amount of marks. Final thing, they're looking for it to be thoroughly researched. Your bibliography doesn't need to be huge and there doesn't even need to be bags of theory, but it but most of your analysis and commentary needs to be underpinned by some kind of theoretical approach. Um, even if it's just as simple as you've done some additional reading on uh, on linguistic relativity and on linguistic rep representations. Yeah, and they also want to see your transcripts, don't they? They want to see your data at the back. It doesn't necessarily have to be annotated, uh, although...
It's a good idea to annotate your data as part of your analysis, um, but you must include your raw data. So bear that in mind, if you are going to study a U two YouTube videos, for example, you are going to have to write a transcript for those um, and include them at the end. And they should be quality transcripts. So anything where you're having to create like a transcript, plan for your time to do that because they do take a while. Like, yeah. An accurate transcription of a five-minute YouTube video could take you anywhere between two and three hours if you're doing it doing it properly. Well, I guess the other thing to say there as well is you need to make sure your data is manageable. So actually, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, someone last year wrote a fantastic investigation. She explored the difference in two Disney princesses um, across time, and she chose three scenes originally for each princess. She could not write that in 1,500 words, and we ended up scaling it right back. Um, so just bear that in mind in terms of, you know, a five minute YouTube video is going to give you a hell of a lot of data. Yeah. You know, a minute is plenty. <laughs> but likewise, though, don't produce too little data. I've yes. had students who have um, done, for example, single screen, crap, single screen captures of WhatsApp messages for a study. And um, uh, it's not enough uh, um, to, to drive, a, drive a study. Um. I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. Um, the other thing I would say, <laughs> we're never getting off this question, is um, someone last year did, she compared, she was looking at um, language used by homosexual YouTubers in comparison to heterosexual YouTubers. And I just want to emphasise now that obviously you we haven't taught you any theory related to that. And there is an expectation, isn't there, that you would go away and, and do your own research and find your own linguistic sort of... Yeah. evidence for that that said um, the cambridge textbook um that accompanies the course if you if you've not seen it it's the student book with a little blue uh, band on the front and it's and it's got a black cover um that does have um little nods to parts of language theory that uh, are not major parts of the course so there is some language and sexuality theory in there there is some language and age theory in there i don't think many have got that book um but buy it yeah, well, I, and I've got a copy at home, so I can always check for you. But the bit, I mean, obviously, that was just one example. The bigger picture is that there's plenty of, especially if you go down a representations investigation, that, you know, you, you might you, you, you might need to be doing your own research. Go into Google Scholar and um, see what you can find. Um, and that is obviously going to take more time. So bear that in mind when you choose a new investigation. OK. Um, an example of a good investigation? Well, there's been many. Um, the TV Chefs one was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so the, I had a student who produced a, um, an investigation of how the language of um, female TV chefs has changed over time. So the, the, the key thing you can see there is... You might be thinking now, well, female TV chefs, is it gender or is it time? She chose female TV chefs because she wanted to control that variable. She wasn't looking at gender. She was looking at how the, the, the language of TV cookery programs has changed over time by focusing purely on female celebrity chefs. So um, she um, got three extracts, um, all from... Um, instruction on how to make a perfect roast dinner or something like that and um, one of them was Nigella that was the most recent one there was a Delia Smith one from the 90s and then there was a Fanny Craddock one from back in the I think in the 70s or the early 80s so she's built in the span of time there um, she took the time to transcribe them really really carefully um, and then what it just led to was a really, really interesting kind of exploration of, of diachronic change in, in the register and language of, of television cookery. And what she really got stuck into and, and the reason it worked really well, she really, really thought about her AO3 in her context and what's changed over time. And if you compare, say, um, Fanny Craddock in the, in the 60s or 70s, who's, who's talking about using plain flour and... Um, and um, using the skin and bones of the chicken to make stock. Um, and then you compare that to Nigella in the 2010s, who's talking about using molasses and, <laughs> um, 
and Bavarian like hardback tam or whatever it, whatever it was. I forget what. It, the, the key point was that she was actually exploring in the Lexus in in the in the semantic fields of food. You could see a shift in from a kind of post-war austerity culture mm. to like our modern like culture of excess where we're buying very expensive rich foods uh that's just one example of some interesting things that she found that had changed over time mm. um she looked very carefully at the context of television production and thought about how um fanny craddock and delia smith are operating in a single camera setup where they are talking to the camera and it's like a lesson as compared as compared to say nigella where um there's multiple cameras in and they're in her house mm. and it's made to look as if like it's not a lesson you're with her in the kitchen and you're a friend yeah, and, and how that changes the dixis and how that intimacy changes the the, the, the language choices mm. um, and she really thought about the multimodal context of the transcript she didn't just get lost in the speech so the reason it was good was because it was it was thoroughly researched it was an interesting angle. It was something she was interested in because she was like a, an avid baker and, and wanted to be a cook. Uh, like, um, and then um, it was just really well considered in terms of the AO1, the AO2 and the AO3. They thought really very carefully about the assessment objectives. And I think it ended up getting um, 21 out of 25, which is a really excellent yeah. outcome for that student. And it's very, it, it, it's, it's, it's much more... Um frequent isn't it that yeah. students will get band five and the original writing and then the investigations um other good examples okay. um the key thing that draws them all together is that idea of a clear methodology the students interested in it and then they think carefully about the interaction between context and language so i've had students produce um uh, a study of how the language of boxing articles has changed over time um i've had students produce uh, comparisons of the um, WhatsApps of male and female occupational groups, i.e., um, work colleagues, and how they how a group of male and female work colleagues talk to one another. That's an in gender studies tend to be a little bit repetitive and kind of cliched sometimes. The reason that was interesting was because it was such a specific dynamic. She was looking at. Uh, uh, um, group occupational interactions mm. on an, in the electronic uh, mode and then the only varying difference was gender so yeah I had a similar one two years ago where um, it was a group of boys and a group of girls I, it was college students so it was Hilda students um, and they were building a tower together so it was again a very precise context where she was looking at how they interacted with each other how they cooperated did anyone take charge uh, and that lent itself to a really nice investigation. I think the other important thing is that sometimes something sounds like it's going to be an amazing investigation, but then when you actually look at the data, it's just not as rich as you thought, or there's actually not that much in it. Um, one this year, which obviously given the circumstances didn't quite get finished, was a really interesting one between Donald Trump's um, um, first announcements as, pr as president when he was first brought in. And compared to um, Nazi Germany, um, in, in like propaganda, and actually it was really interesting the actual um, comparisons. And Trump was calling foreigners aliens, um, and so I don't know. I think just kind of be tentative in terms of your data and in terms of your idea. Don't write off an idea thinking you won't get rich data because you could, um, and vice versa. So I think that's why. You need to plan your time carefully. Don't leave this to the last minute deciding what you want to do. Um, we do need to as well think about what what's going to work for you in the context you're currently in in, in lockdown. Um, it's going to be a lot of lockdown studies. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I know a lot of you are quite passionate about child language and wanting to go to primary schools, and that's obviously very unlikely to happen now. Um, so. Um, I think we'll maybe talk about that at the end. Let's let's move through the rest of the questions first. Um, common mistakes? Anything anything to add? I think it's not not being organised or not being organised, uh, not thinking carefully about your data and how you're going to collect it and how you're going to control your variables. Yeah. Um, don't some... don't do don't collect your data until you've checked with me yeah. that your approach is going to work. Uh, picking something that you're not interested in. Yeah. Uh, and I know that can be really difficult um, sometimes for teenagers to, to pick something that they're interested in. 
Um, but try, try not to get yourself into a position where your teacher is telling you just do this because you won't enjoy it. You won't have that agency. You won't feel like you're doing something um, kind of interesting that you've chosen. Try and pick something that you actually care about. Link it to your other subjects or link it to your career ambitions. Yeah. Um, if you are interested in becoming a, um, it's a bad example, sorry, but if you're interested in becoming, you know, if you're working in sports media, then then do some kind of investigation that links to sports media. Um, if you study psychology, um, you know, I've had students who've actually enjoyed doing comparisons of key stage three and key, key stage four and bleh, key <laughs> stage four and key stage five psychology textbooks. Mm. And it that sounds quite dry, I'm sure, because this student really enjoyed psychology. They just really liked actually doing it, and and then and for them it was to explore the difference between, um, you know, what they were looking, how those texts were functioning linguistically at key stage four, and how they were at key stage five. A good one I had a couple of years ago was um, she wanted to be a lawyer, um, and she investigated the different closing statements for a male lawyer and a female lawyer. Yeah, I had a few difficulties because there was a lot of variables, like the um, the dialect, for example, except, and like obviously the court case was different, but it, she did come out with some really, really insightful ideas because she was so engaged with what a lawyer should be doing in a closing statement, etc. Uh, and another common mistake is, um, I, I'm kind of going over the old ground here, but it's choosing data that doesn't actually work together. And very often this is because students are led astray by being perhaps a little bit too passionate and interested. I, for example, had a student a couple of years ago who wanted to compare the lyrics of opera music to rap music. Right now, they were really excited about exploring rap, rap lyrics in, in some form or another because they were they were a huge rap fan. But the 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 problem was that they weren't actually really thinking very clearly and they were they were going to go and investigate something that they didn't know much about. For example, they didn't think about the fact that opera actually is very very rarely in english it's nearly always in like italian for example <laughs> yeah so you can't compare italian and he was like well i'll translate it but then that's not a quality text like a google translation of an opera is not a quality text compared to um rap and it adds another variable in doesn't it yeah. what i student ended up on, on working on instead was a comparison of um of modern west coast rap to classic um, West Coast rap from like the golden age of, of hip hop mm. so that was a much better investigation he ended up going off it in the end anyway because he, he, he just he, he decided to do something else but that would have been a better investigation because it was more well thought through mm. just don't let your passions lead you to a thing where you actually realise halfway through oh this isn't going to work as, as mm. interested as I am it's not a linguistic study and, and I think just be systematic with it don't don't rush ahead or don't start doing analysis on data like if everything needs to be staged you set up your introduction well you work out firstly what you want to do get it checked by me i can even send it to the board to get it checked tell me what your methodology is get that checked then collect your data then get that checked and then start your analysis so it really does have to be a really systematic approach and the worst thing you could do is just sit and, and rush it and get it all done without getting anything checked because i will just be so upset if I have to say to you that you need to start again. It would be horrible. And um, so will you. Yeah. And there are, there's just so many pot, uh, like, potholes? Yeah, potholes that you can kind of fall down with this, that, that you know, you can make one small mistake in, in your choices of data and, and, and the whole thing could fall apart. It's very easy for it to go wrong, isn't it? Not not to make it sound scary. Just, just it's also super fun. Just keep an open discussion with your, with whoever's tutoring you. Which is me. Okay, um, I feel like we've covered this, but I think actually now is a good time to link into the lockdown and the situation that we're currently in. Um, obviously, we're at the point now where we, we there's maybe a chance that you'll be coming back before the summer. Um, but I think in terms of data collection, you can't really be relying on the opportunity to be going out into your communities and collecting data that way. Um, one way around that that I've thought of so far um, is to to be using things text that have already been produced so youtube transcripts yeah. or tv news looking at you know how um you know you've got a lot of comparisons of politicians oh the new zealand leader compared to johnson would be quite interesting uh, as a woman and then 
Mm. What, what, what guys we think what's the problem with comparing Johnson to New Zealand I know different. not only is she a woman <laughs> there's she might be of a different political leaning in a different country um so same there's a lot topic, there's a lot of variables there so but hey, something and you could evaluate them couldn't you, you? Could do, it's yeah. only off the top of my head um, um some ideas um if you've got family members who are doing zoom meetings like ooh, say your yeah. dad's doing a zoom meeting um transcribe his zoom meeting with his boss compared to him talking to say his fa his father on the phone mm. and then or on or not on the phone sorry on uh on facetime and think about how does the shifting context of uh affect his language usage and it'd be like an occupational study um you, could, you could do it gender wise and look at like a female in your household versus yeah. a male but you'd have to make sure they're similar of age yeah. and in a similar context you could look at uh, Boris Johnson's first national address where he told everybody, uh, what was it? Um, People will die. Yeah, and um, if your friends tell you to go out, oh, no, don't no. go out. Uh, <laughs> and that was great. Little, uh, but then compare you that to the, no. to the one he, yeah, he should say no. <laughs> compare that to what he said uh, when he announced the stay alert. Um, and what's interesting about those is that you're choosing two pre-recorded um they were pre-recorded, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. You, you're choosing two pre-recorded national addresses, one uh, before the peak and one after the peak, and thinking about how has that changed the language? I think I know on right, investigating anything to do with coronavirus, though, is that it really depends on how you're reacting to this. And if, like me, sometimes you get a bit saturated with it and, and it really affects your mood sometimes, then I think it's wise to stay away from it. Um, you know, just be a bit, a bit wise or know yourself. Otherwise, the internet uh, is a rich uh, repository of text for you to choose. So, uh, Miss Bird alluded to the fact that many of you are interested in doing child language investigations. Yep. So, you might be disheartened that you're not going to be able to get to go to a primary school. But there's loads of YouTube videos out there of, of people interacting with their kids. Or, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of YouTube channels that are run by children, like these unboxing channels, for example, and there's these child influencers, aren't there? Yeah. So if you if you get creative with what you think it is that you want to explore, um, you know, you could compare the language of, of child influencers with adult influencers in YouTube videos, for example. And, yeah. and just again, another idea spitballing off the top of my head, just try to be creative in the way you select and source your data. Well, I mean, you could, it's, I suppose it depends who you know, but, you know, if you know two, three year olds who are of different genders, you could look at how the parents, you know, get them. You could set it up, just ask somebody, ask people, you know, can you record a one minute video of you speaking to your child about this, please? Um, you know, and there's a lot you could do that with any of the gender stuff that we, uh, sorry, child language stuff that we've done. An interesting one last year was, um, that she was, it was in a primary school, but she actually taught um, a boy and a girl and she looked at how they reacted differently to her language and she was looking to see is there a difference in gender in the language of, of boys and girls at, at even that young an age so there's ways you can still focus on young children but also bring in gender as well the one thing i would say and in, in some ways um it, it's a bizarre advantage of perhaps your limited ability to create your own data in some ways um I forget which theory it is, but there's this idea of the uh, of the decline of reliability of data. Uh, anything that you have interacted with yourself in some ways is going to be unreliable data because it's yeah. that you are an observer who has interacted. So let's say that you tell people to sit down and have a conversation about X so you can record them and they know they're going to be recorded and they've been given direction on what they have to talk about. It's not a naturalist setting. It's not a naturalist setting. The very, so I'll, I forget, I'll, I'll find it for Miss Bird and she can show it to you if she so wishes, but this, this, this theory of the decline of reliability of data, the most reliable data is pre-existing data yeah. that you have not had any interaction with whatsoever. Weather. so for example whatsapp messages are great because when people were texting them, each other they weren't thinking about being observed they weren't thinking about i've been told to text about a specific mm -hmm. thing another example social uh, media feeds social media like feeds yeah. harry potter groups like me yeah. <laughs> or you know uh, song lyrics and etc because they are in a vacuum you know if you were to ask uh, a male and female um 
you were to ask a male and female rapper to do a freestyle for you and record that as data, that data wouldn't be as good as just comparing a pre-recorded song by a male and female rapper. But that don't let that put you off. Like that's yeah. something you can identify as a limitation and get marks for for evaluating yeah. and, and, and picking that apart. But likewise, don't feel that you have to create your own data. Yeah. Um, a last thing I'd just say about gender is just sometimes students get confused. Are they studying the differences between male and female language or are they studying the differences between male, how males and females are represented? So, for example, if you were going to compare a pregnancy book for a mother compared to a pregnancy book for a father, you're probably going to see a lot of differences in those. But that's in that case, you'd be analysing the representation of the, the, the each gender. That's very different to you analysing yeah. um, how men and women speak differently. And, and in this latter case, that's where you bring in all your gender theories. In the first case, actually, that's not a gender study. You can't be using your lake off in your tan and you're actually looking at representation. Um, if you're looking at the difference between male and female writers, then that's different. Then you can bring in your gender. Um, but, so just bear that in mind. I think that's just a distinction to make. Um, Right, well, uh, I think we can wrap it up there. Yep, yeah, any any final thoughts? Good luck. Yeah, enjoy. I'll, I'll keep on having a think about, um, you know, lockdown and how we can overcome that. Um, and yeah, just keep in touch, uh, keep talking to me, keep bouncing ideas, um, and hopefully we'll get a really good set of investigations. Take care, guys. Oh, uh, thank you to Mr Rose for his time. I can't see you nodding. <laughs> thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>